Test, test one, two. For the folks who are watching on YouTube, this is a test from the podium mic. All right, simmer down. 
Everybody uh, thawed out from the uh, weather? Now, I am an Arizona native. Any Arizona natives in here? Wonderful. I love it. Um, anything below 80, and I'm cold. All right. Welcome to night number two, session number two of Citizens Leadership Institute 2021. For those of you who haven't by this point, please sign in so I know that you're here. Um, we also have a couple of handouts from the first night uh, that we uh, did not include in the original packet, uh, a copy of the mission and vision of the city, and then uh, the organizational chart that uh, city manager Brian Powell referred to during his presentation. So make sure you pick those up before the end of the night. We do have, as I mentioned, a number of people who are watching uh, online tonight, and everyone is um, welcome to do that. Just give me a, a little heads up at least um, a couple hours before and then once we have the YouTube link, I will send it out to everybody. Because of that, I wanna make sure everybody's understanding that the audio is very important for the folks who are watching online. So um, our presenters will probably stay here at the podium. I also have a handheld mic. If you need to ask a question, ask the question. I'm gonna uh, remind the presenters just to repeat that question so everybody can hear what you're asking. If you are online, and like I said, I'm sitting over here monitoring the folks who are watching online, there, it's a YouTube link. So on the side of the YouTube link is a little chat box. You type in your question in that chat box and then I will relay it from where I'm sitting to the presenter. Everybody understand that? Okay. Uh, housekeeping, in case you've forgotten, bathrooms are out that door. We go straight out that back door when we're done. Um, anybody have uh, Kansas City or Tampa Bay? Just making sure in case we have wagering going on, you know. Remember, that's only for fun and not for economic purposes. Okay, let's get going. Our uh, first presenter of the night is a very distinguished gentleman who I have nothing but fabulous and wonderful things to say about. Don't end sentences with a proposition. He is born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, went to Brigham Young University in Utah where he um, earned a degree in public health and a minor in business, and then went to the greatest university in uh, the state of Arizona, the original land-grant university, the University of Arizona in Tucson, where he uh, earned a master's in public uh, administration with a focus on public finance, which has much to do with what we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, he spent a couple of years with the uh, Arizona State Legislature before they went south in the Joint uh, Legislative Budget Committee, and then he is coming up on his 14th anniversary with the city of Apache Junction, uh, the last several, as assistant city manager. And so, to talk to all about the budget, something everyone probably has to deal with in some way, shape, or form, even at their own house, you're gonna see how it's done at the municipal level, and particularly how we do it here at the city of Apache Junction. So, for our first presentation of the evening, my boss, the assistant city manager of the city of Apache Junction, Mr. Matt Busby. Thanks, Al. Hi, everyone. I hate introductions like that. Makes me feel like I'm at a NBA game, I should be giving the high fives as I run out of the huddle or something. I hate standing behind one of these. Um, some of you know me. I've been here, like Al said, almost 14 years, or you've seen me sitting up here. I'm not saying much during council meetings, trying to stay out of the limelight, but uh, I'm the assistant city manager. I uh, worked for the, the city almost 14 years, like I said, Al, Al uh, mentioned. Uh, fifth generation native Arizonan. Um, as uh, my great, great, great grandfather came over from England, went to Utah, then down to, down to Arizona, and they settled down the St. David area, if anyone, anybody knows down there, back, on your way to Tombstone, as you cross the San Pedro River. Um, my grandfather uh, was a cattle rancher here in Arizona for a long time, um, and uh, between Casa Grande, Tucson, St. David, went back and forth there, and so we've, we've been in Arizona a long time, and uh, my dad and, uh, my mom settled in Tucson where, where he grew up. So um, don't hold that against me being from Tucson. I know some, some natives, you know, there's a little rivalry. So, um, and don't say the score the last, last uh, football game because I'll just ignore it. But uh, that was sad. 
Um, so a little bit about me, let's see. This is kind of a lame slide, but um, I never thought I'd end up in this uh, occupation. I didn't know it existed uh, when I was younger. I was thinking of being a, a doctor or uh, an accountant. I've, I've, my father and two brothers are CPAs, and I thought that was what, what people do. And uh, took my first managerial accounting um, class in college and said, this is not for me. I, I'm, I'm done with this and, and changed majors. Um, so I studied public health, and I really like the epidemiology side of health, uh, which is the statistical modeling and, and researching and stuff like that. Uh, but as I uh, got into my graduate work, I uh, was debating whether to go into hospital administration, but I found out about this thing, uh, city management, which I uh, really fell in love with, and it kind of fit with some of my values. And I think that's, those are the same values that some of you probably share, and that's the reason you're here tonight. It's, it's about community. It's about giving back. It's about wanting to to help those around you in whatever way you can. And in the way I've found to do that is through um, our local government, which is the, the level of government that's closest to the people, right? And oftentimes we deal with the most um, uh, intimate of things, you know, and you think of what a city does, we hope you don't have uh, many, many complaints, but you think of the most basic things. You drive on the roads, you pick up the phone and you call 911, you flush the bad stuff down the toilet and it goes away and you never have to deal with it again. Uh, you turn on your tap and water comes out that you can drink safely. Uh, those very basic things uh, that, that we deal with. And that's what makes our, our job here, here great. Um, and so we hope that you don't have major problems with those, those things, right? Um, but all of those things are connected with this budget process. And so when I first started giving this presentation, it was super boring, and it may still be, so I apologize. But I got into a lot of the numbers. You'll see some graphs later that I'll just cruise through, and you can have copies of them if you want. But, you know, how much tax we bring in and what our expenditures and departments are, that's the boring stuff. Um, I want to tell you about a little bit about uh, how, how the budget process works. Um, oh, I, I should say I live in the city. I'm in the Renaissance Point neighborhood right off uh, Ironwood Southern. Lived here about four, uh, four years. Before that, I was right next door in Mesa um, uh, for about eight years there. So I uh, love living here. Being in the community you serve is, is real great, and you get to know a lot of people, uh, not only through work, but, but through just being neighborly. So I have uh, two children, 14-year-old son, and a 11-year-old daughter, and, and my wife. Uh, so um, she's a dental hygienist. Went back to school shortly after we had our second. So. Um, I'm happy they, they uh, support me in my job, which is really busy. And um, so I want to hear a little bit about you all, not necessarily your personal lives, but um, who here budgets? These are just some, some budgets. Okay. You, you do budget. How do you budget? Like, what, how would you define budget? What you do with your budget? What's that? A plan for spending money. Usually your own money, right? You could be helping someone, you know, some financial planners, or, or maybe you're helping your um, parents or siblings or something. Who else? How would you define budgeting? All right, you know what you have to spend, and you make sure you don't spend any more than that. And hopefully you're putting some away too, right? For a rainy day, yeah. Contingencies. What do you mean? Tell me more about that. Oh, you got your direct deposit from the feds, huh? No. Oh, your car repair. I heard cart. I thought you meant like bank account or something. I don't know why I thought. Oh yeah, yes. You can do the unplanned things you need to plan for because that's what rainy day funds are for. Those are hard to maintain. Uh, we want to spend our money and and. Honestly, society tells us we should spend our money as fast as we can and put it on credit cards and all that, right? It's usually not the best approach. Oh, budgeting, who else has a different uh, uh, way to describe it? From the online folks, S budget so you don't go into the red and making decisions within financial boundaries. Okay. Good, that, that's an A-plus student there. I think they read my presentation beforehand. Um, do you like budgeting? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> I saw some real enthusiasm. Yeah? Why do you like budgeting? 
<laughs> You're a nerd, all right. Plenty of nerds here. Some nerds don't like budgeting. I just want to be inclusive. You shook your head no, Pat. And back there, you don't like budgeting? Okay. Yeah. Why do you say you have to do it? You have responsibilities, right? Yeah. Pat. Say it again. Future expenses. Future expenses. You know something's coming down the road, or you want to plan for something. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big one. How many people do you know that didn't plan for retirement, and they've just, you know, most people, right? They think their plan is Social Security, and that, that, is, that is the... What do they call it? The safety net or, or whatever, but you hope they're doing more, right? Were you going to say something else? Uh, I was just going to say that your budget tells you that you're more about the money than you spend it around. Yeah, you, okay. You don't know for certain things that you're going to spend this amount of money. Yeah. 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 So we said that um, you can tell a lot about a person by looking at their budget. And I didn't know your financial planner. I'm glad you said that because I, I was about to say who would share advisor. Sorry, advisor. Sometimes I, I mix those two terms. That they're very different. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Because I, I was going to ask you who just lets shares their budget with you. Probably not many people. Right. It's kind of a private thing. Yeah. In your case, everybody, but they're coming to you to, to share that. Others were probably kind of private about that. Um, you probably wouldn't just uh, share what your income is to your neighbors uh, or, or what, uh, whether you're in the red or the black or, or whatever, right? So there's lots of things uh, about budgeting that, uh, that are uh, very similar to how we do it in, in the government as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple process, and you described it real well when you said you look at what you have coming in, and you got a plan for how it goes out. D didn't I say, didn't someone say they didn't like budgeting? Did I hear from them? Did you give us a reason why? Well, I don't. Yeah. Well, I, I grew up with an uncle who was a vice president of the Valley Bank. So I grew up in banking. Okay. You knew how to use a uh, check uh, register young, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they don't teach kids that now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And some people like that. They like getting in the details. Others don't. We're just some of us aren't big detail people, right? Or numbers people, or whatever. But but it's important enough that we do it. Um, it's probably the single most important thing we do at the city, and your, your elected city council does, um, because it's to the tune of 40 or $50 million. Um, there's different parts of the budget too, right? There's uh, some things you have to address, like bills that are like more, if you're thinking of business terms, like fixed costs, right? Um, then there's uh, the, the contingencies that you gotta plan for. And then there's sometimes the, the fun stuff or the new stuff that, that you want to do to, to improve your own life or your own uh, happiness, however you approach it. I go through this process just to, to help you understand that it's, it's honestly very similar how we do it in the government. Um, we have to take a look at how much money we're bringing in. We have to take all the best data that we have access to um, and, and try to uh, plan ahead for what revenue we're going to get the next year. Um, then we have to go through a rigorous process of, of uh, paying for employees and their insurances and, and knowing how many new employees we need or new equipment that they need or what replacement schedule that equipment might be on. Um, and the expanding things like uh, um, uh, the, the community is demanding a, a new park or something like that. 
Well, think of that in synonymous terms of you're planning uh, for your kid's birthday, right? There's something new they want. When they get teenagers, they now they want iPhones instead of the action figures, right? And so you have to adjust. Of course, who can guess what the big difference is between the personal budget and the budgeting in the government? What's, what's some things that come to your mind? What, what would be the difference? So we kind of look at the similar things, right? But what's, what's a... Okay. Is everyone, state law says you have to have a balanced budget. You guys know what that means? What's a balanced budget? Tess, you want to say it in your own terms? Um, just like going out, you have to have it all in the account to go out. Okay. Go over. Okay. Spending has to equal income. Has to equal income. Yeah. What do we call it when it doesn't happen, when we spend more than we have income in the government? Deficit, Deficit spending, right? What do you call that in your personal life? Oh, crap. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> Debt, credit cards, uh, loans, IOUs. Um, you get in too deep in that hole and you can't get out. And we see that in government sometimes, too. Even in cities, they, they get in too far. Um, that can be a decision uh, by... Uh, um, not having good staff or elected officials don't care. Um, not, they don't care. Some may not care. I'm not saying you all don't care, but, um, but our state, the state of Arizona requires all cities to have a balanced budget. That means that our city council can not adopt the budget that the income doesn't equal or is more than the ex planned expenditures. And they hold us to it. So we have to submit it when we pass the budget after the city council adopts it. And then if we go over that, we, there's processes laid out in our city code that they have to go in and adjust it. Uh, so if they know in a department, say police, for some reason we had to hire more suddenly and we were gonna go over the adopted budget, we'd have to go to the city council and go through process, public hearings, uh, let the public know what we're doing. So our budgeting is a little different in that regard, right? It's a very more public process than maybe your personal budget is. And you got seven people to try to get to agree on how to spend the money. And so that adds another dynamic that makes budgeting a little more complex or challenging maybe in the, in the public sector. And not only those seven people, we have 42,000 people um, talking to them as well. Although most don't, don't follow the budgeting process. But we do have quite a few, you get contacted uh, um, People who watch the meetings, right? Councilman, Councilmember Nesser and Mayor Wilson, or on Facebook, people are asking this or that, or or a newspaper article hits the the Facebook, and uh, you start getting lots of questions, and and that's part of the public process. That's what we deal with, and it's a public dollar, so it should be that way, right? So, part of that framework we operate within. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. You you went forward for me, huh? So we have some laws that tell us what we have to spend money on. Like we as a local government have to have a police department. Um, whether we contract out like Queen Creek used to and have a sheriff's office, Maricopa County come and provide that service, they have to provide some police and safety if you're an incorporated city. If you're not an incorporated city, you're covered by the sheriff. The counties have to provide that service. That's set in state law. But then there's things that we want to or our community wants. What are some things that we budget for that maybe community members want or even demand from their local government? Library. Maybe it's a required thing. Library, multi-gen, multi which is like recreation, right? Parks, parks and rec, our, our parks. Really, isn't, we aren't required to do that, but what does that do for us? When we budget for that, what does it bring to our community? Quality of what was that? Quality of life, Quality of life people, Taxpayer. taxpayers. Sometimes it's a draw from outside, right? So they come to your community and spend money. We're a very sales tax driven revenue. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it can be an incentive um, for companies to move in, that's right. Because they look for things like good schools, good quality of life, good parks, um, uh, all sorts of stuff, right? So just like your personal life, we have some things we have to, we're required to worry about and do and others we can be a little more flexible in can expand more if we want to, or we can do a minimal amount. And you see that in the different communities. Oftentimes that's what drives people to locate the different communities. 
Uh, they, that, that community has a combination of um, attributes. Some come from what the local government provides, come, some come from the people that, that live there, the, the housing stock, whatever it might be, the schools, the employment, all those things go into it. So our budget has a direct impact on all that stuff, which, like your personal lives, is what makes it so important. We have to worry about it. We have to put a lot of diligent effort into it. So in that framework, council are the ones that set priorities. They can't possibly know every little thing that every department knows. In your personal life, you probably do know where most every single penny goes. And if you don't, you probably should <laughs> um, because you're probably hemorrhaging money somewhere if you, if you don't know. But as local government, um, there's no way those seven people can know where all that $40 million goes. But as we go through the budget process with them, we do it line by line. When I say line by line, we have an office supply budget. And if they have a question about how many uh, pencils we're planning in that budget, they can ask us. That may be a little too granular to, to share, uh, but, but we have some departments actually that do plan to that, that level. Others, you know, it's a $500 office supply budget because they know they need to buy folders and paper that year. They don't plan to the, the very specific, but some do, they, they have an exact budget. But that line item that it rolls up into office supplies, each department has one of those, and, they, and the city council sees that in a line. And uh, we spend time on, with them one-on-one, -on -one, and they can ask those questions. I've had four-hour-long meetings with one council member where they went through, why did this line item go up by $200? To me, I'm kind of like, well, does it matter, $200 in office supplies? Again, some people, it matters a lot. Some people, we... we don't think of it in that granular terms. But that's the rightest council members. They represent a certain subset of our population and they, they want those answers. So we provide it to them the best we can. Then a lot of other stuff goes into our, um, the decision-making environment, our CAFR. That's an acronym for Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. The state requires us to submit that at the end of the year. We tell them exactly an audited number, how much money we brought in and how much we spent. It's available to the public when it's finalized. Ours will be finalized for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020. It should be posted on the website next month. We're just putting up the, the final touches. Usually it's done December, January. This year, because of a transition in the department, we were a little behind. So we have a lot of uh, regulatory things that we have to show very specific information to the public. Um, since the council um, sets priorities, Al, when do I go to? We started a little late, about five, 10 more minutes, something like that? Two minutes left. Okay. We took even up under two minutes this time. <laughs> I wanna leave <laughs> as much time as you need. She's the fun one. Everyone wants to talk about economic development. Um, this was a vision and mission that, that at the very root of all that we do, the city council gave to us uh, as, as employees of the city, as they represented the, uh, the citizens, the vision for the community and the mission. And we try to incorporate this at a very basic level and that drives up and influences everything we do. And so we try to highlight this. Um, and this year with a, new, with a few new council members, a new mayor, we'll be having a, a planned strategic planning session or, or visioning session in, in a few months. We're gonna talk to them about that soon, but that'll drive um, next year's budget because it will be too late for, for this year, this coming year's budget. But if they wanna adjust any of this or get into different um, uh, focus, you know, kind of, uh, what do they call it? the Turn the rudder to, to steer the ship or whatever, right? It, uh, it can be done over time through our uh, elected officials and their vision and mission. So th this is where it starts getting real boring. So sorry. But this is uh, the basic timeframes each year. December, we really start looking hard at all those things, like what do we think the revenue is gonna be next year? Um, it's when our CAFR is completed, that gives us good insight in, into how close we were in our forecast for our revenues and our expenditures, if we budgeted the right amount in both of those categories. Um, and then in January, departments start what I refer to as uh, base budgeting, which means they start from where they were last year and they either go down or up. And they, if they go up, they have to justify it, right? Anything new beyond last year and beyond um, automatic increases, like there's some personnel costs that we have no control over. Social Security goes up or, or Medicare payments or whatever it is. 
Um, but departments have to justify and provide written justification for anything they're changing dramatically beyond that baseline budget, that, that bottom budget. So they start inputting that all into the system. February, March, we start deciding and putting final touches on what we think our revenue is going to be. That drives so much. Understanding what you have coming in drives so much and what, what you can do. Um, not just what you can spend, but how much you want to put away, say, for a bank, how much you need to put in contingency, right? All those basic things we're looking at. And then March, uh, the budget committee, which consists of uh, a few staff members, submits a proposed budget to the city manager. He reviews it, asks a lot of questions, and then when he's done with that, he prepares what, what we refer to as the city manager proposed budget. And uh, that's where we start meeting with council members, then they start looking through all those lines and asking us questions. And, and we do that one-on-one -on -one because if it was, it was uh, more than that, it'd be a public meeting. If they meet together as a body, they have to meet as a, um, in a public setting, open meeting law, right? So we just get their questions one-on-one, -on -one, and often they ask the same questions in public that they, they ask us in those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, but we go through a lot of details there and they get a chance to look at, like I said, every line. And you, um, everything we give them, we post on the website as well as our proposed budget. So the line items are even available to the, the public to see. Um, and so uh, that, I, I, think, um, I think it's ajcity.net slash budget is where we have all the budgets listed. And all the CAFRs are, uh, I think I have it listed at the end of the presentation. It's ajcity.net slash financial reports. Next, we have public hearings. That's where we present to the city council in a public setting what the budget is, the revenues, expenditures, all the departments, any special things like uh, capital needs or large expenditures. And um, then the, the public can give their input or quest get questions answered or um, uh, go through that open process where they can see it. And then we have what, we've, what state law refers to as a tentative budget adoption. So we have to, according to state law, adopt a tentative budget. Then we have to publish it in a newspaper for how long, Jennifer? Two weeks? Mm -hmm. Two consecutive weeks. Two consecutive weeks. I say that again? It's four consecutive weeks. Okay, it's four consecutive Okay, because we don't have a local newspaper. We have to do it four consecutive weeks and one that has a certain distribution. Yeah. The Arizona Republic? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's so as many people as possible in our residents can, can have, can see the budget before it's uh, finally adopted. And usually we do that in June um, before the fiscal year starts, which is July 1 timeframe. Three major fund sources, um, I mean general fund, that's the biggest part of our budget, probably represents uh, oh, almost 30 million of the 40 to 45 million of the budget. Those three main fund, uh, the, I mean, sources of funds, state revenue sh sharing, we get a portion of the state's income tax. Um, and cities in Arizona can't charge their own income tax. You might find that different in other states. Uh, I think Texas has a big income tax. And then we get also a portion of that 5.6% at the state level of the shared sales tax. And all those distributions are based on our population compared with the other cities. So there's formulas, complex, formulas and state statute and that we don't have a city property tax uh, many cities do possibly even most cities in Arizona but they vary on how much that is according to the budget some have large property taxes others don't typically in Arizona it's the counties that have the larger property tax and all those districts the community college districts health districts all that library dis districts I do like to to point this out though because we have the fire district um, which is a little unique, um, it pre-exists the city. Many cities provide the, their own fire department, we don't. Um, so we have a, a municipal, a typically municipal service that is funded by a property tax. So whenever we start talking about the city doesn't have property taxes, we like to just clarify, well remember we do have a property tax paying for a, a service for the residents that's typically provided by a municipality or a city. Of course, that district boundaries goes way out to, I think, Queen Valley or something. So it, its taxing base is much larger than just our residents, too. So, uh, but just a little uh, tidbit of information there. Then we have our local sales tax, 2.4%. Um, some some uh, 
0.2% of that is dedicated to roads and, and another 0.2 of that, that 2.4 total is for public safety retirement costs. That's what PSPRS is, Public Safety Personnel Retirement System. So neat graphs, do they get this uh, if they wanna yeah. look at it? Okay, this is just a, a breakout of the revenue. Um, sales tax collections moderately increasing over the years. So you see it's not leaps and bounds that we're increasing every year. Um, and these are just all the different sources of revenue. Uh, where they go, we kind of talked about that, all the different departments, right? Some required by law, some not. Another graph showing that same thing. And then we have what we call the Higher User Revenue Fund, and that's also um, based in state law, and that's our, that's your gas tax. It hasn't been raised since 1991 or something. Um, and you can see in this graph uh, kind of the strain that puts on our road budget. As you see, it's pretty flat. Legislature did a couple things to try to make up for some things they did in the past here <laughs> and here. But um, I think in the past we were up probably closer to seven or eight million for our roads. Now remember on a slide, two, uh, slide or so back, we talked about that 0.2% sales tax. This is part of the reason because we can't adjust our gas tax. But roads get more expensive to maintain, more expensive to build, you know, cost of living keeps going up, yet our, our road um, thing doesn't, doesn't keep up that, our road revenue. Um, just shows that the two main functions of, of the HERF money, the state statute limits you to spend it only on roads and everything associated with them, which uh, has a lot to do with the engineering as well. Um, couple minutes for questions. You can read the rest of this when you get it, but um, I have a couple uh, things about the budget websites there. But do you have any questions for me? I, I ran through it uh, fast at the end. Yes, sir. What kind, of debt does the city have? what kind of debt does the city have? So the city, for our size, we had one of the lowest bonded indebtedness of any city in Arizona, our size. And so we have a small amount of debt um, through uh, a bond through the state. It's called the Greater Arizona Development Authority on our library expansion. I think we have five more years uh, to pay off on that, that bond. Something like 300,000, something like that's in our, in our CAFR. I'm sorry, it's 300,000 a year. We did, yeah, we saved a couple hundred thousand dollars in interest by, by refinancing. Um, and then we have a small amount we owe to the county for our portion of Ironwood Road when it was expanded. So that's still considered a debt, it's on the books, but, it, but it's not considered like a bond where we went to the voters to, to uh, uh, borrow it. And then um, our water district, which only covers about a third of the residents of the city, um, they have uh, the debt for their new water plant, which allowed us to treat our own water from CAP canal, not buy it from, from others. It also allows us to treat that water instead of pump it out of our, our groundwater resources. So we can preserve those as long as we can. Um, beyond that, um, the other debt, the other things that would be considered debt would be that um, public safety retirement system. There's an unfunded liability, which we have very little control over because it's all driven by decisions at the state. But we keep a close eye on that to make sure that it doesn't get to the point that um, we don't have to do something. Some cities in Arizona, Yuma, Flagstaff, they've already done it, have done what we call punch, pension obligation bonds. But we're not quite there yet to where we want to do that. But that's about $27 million in unfunded liability. Over time, that should reduce. As people retire or the retirees pass away and part of that money's not going out, that, that unfunded liability will go down. So those are really the only debts that the city has. This building, the MGC, it's all paid off. Um, and that, that was based on uh, long-time planning of, of the city council then, so. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
So we don't have any incentives or built-in structure. Um, we've always been really sensitive about you know bonus systems or or anything like that because um, oftentimes the public will will look negatively on that, especially in the, the government setting. Um, but what we do, um, the term we use to refer to what you're saying is budget dumping. People want to get rid of that budget, so it looks like they're needing it. Um, part of how we do what we do to avoid that is this: what I referred to earlier as the baseline budget. Your starting point the next year, unless we have like a big decrease of known revenues going down, it's your baseline. You're going to start there. Now, we still question it. We still dig in. We still have all the, the justifications they wrote from the last year, so we can dig in. If they didn't spend money, say they only, in that case, they only spent 250 to 500, we're going to ask those department directors, okay, explain to me why you still need that 500. Um, What's different now? You didn't spend it last year. So we get into those discussions. But as far as incentives, no, we don't have a, a system in place to provide incentives for people kind of uh, approaching that this way. But, but we're, we actively manage it and encourage people not to do that. We don't want to spend dollars just to spend dollars. So, yeah, Jennifer. When there's money left over in the budget, what do they do with it? It's not been spent. It goes into our savings account. Um, in some cases, that savings account builds to a point to where we feel comfortable to budget the next year to take care of some more one-time costs that, that are larger, like capital needs. Other times, it sits there <laughs> uh, and you know, for a rainy day fund. Um, we plan a certain contingency every year in the budget just in case, so we don't have to go back to council if there's an emergency. We plan about, uh, I think it's about a million dollars. Um, but if we ever spend that, it wouldn't be, that's not available to spend for anything. We'd have to come back and talk to council about it, that sort of thing. But we wouldn't have to get budget authority, per se. Um, but yeah, any, any leftover, and we, we do, and, and that shows in the CAFR how much we didn't spend, um, if the revenues were real good or expenditures were low, and that rolls into a savings account, goes into our resources. Yeah. Uh, the, the limiting factor would um, well any expenditure the city does has to be a budgeted expenditure unless under certain emergency situations uh, um, but yeah to, to spend that money we'd have to show it in the, in the budget and you'll see it in our budget sometimes we have like a general savings line to show that as a revenue source. And that, that usually is attached to some large single expenditure, like a big building repair or something like that. Other questions? Yes. Now we're going into the economic development world. What percentage do, uh, um, of our uh, revenue comes from winter visitors? Um, I will tell you that if we look at sales tax collections, the curve increases dramatically as they come in. So when you're looking at December, well, even really starting October, you start seeing it come up. They're getting coming here, they're getting supplies. They have a huge, huge impact on our, our local collections. And so um, probably October through April, May timeframe, that's um, the time of year where we're really looking at the revenues to make sure they're coming in where we plan for so but a percentage I can't really give you it's just they they do impact it greatly if, if all of a sudden none of them came we'd be in a world of hurt yeah yeah well and this is a it, so the the question is um we know snowbirds likely won't come back in the same numbers, so we are going into a budget year knowing that our revenues are gonna be, look, look a lot different. One interesting factor is that this past year, according to what's going in, showing in our CAFR, we had one of our best revenue years. And so we're trying to figure that out, and that goes into a lot of this thinking through and planning for the budget of how do we reconcile those two things and how do we get a good budget number. Um, we believe a huge part of that increase this past year was uh, online sales, right? It's hard to point at it exactly, but people were home more. They got a lot of government checks. 
and they're spending their money on online retails. And because of some Supreme Court case law now, uh, the Wayfair case, um, places like Amazon and other large retailers have to remit those sales tax through the states down to the cities wherever that they were bought. So we're thinking that it, sh it should be okay. <laughs> but we're still figuring out what, yeah, what exactly that impact is. It's really tough. Some, some sort of an offset. Yeah. But we were really surprised. I mean, it, it's been our best collection year ever this, this past year. So, and that, that's, what's that? All of Arizona. Yep. All of Arizona cities are experiencing that for the most part. Yeah. Good questions. Okay, I think I've taken up enough time. I think I took too long, sorry. Thank you everyone for paying attention. I hope you learned something. If you have questions, you can always get a hold of me. Um, just ask Al. And uh, happy to talk more if you didn't get a chance to, to ask something you wanted to ask. All right, thanks everyone. Matt Busby. Thank you, Mr. Busby. Um, uh, now everybody can go home and balance their checkbook. So th and one of the reasons why um, uh, Mr. Busby likes to go through that process in the timeline is we're getting into that time of the year. So this is a chance for anybody who does have interest and do, and do want to sort of lobby the council in that way about things that you find uh, important in our city, this is the time to be able to do that because the formulation of the budget is going on over the next three or four months. Remember, all municipalities and most of the governments in Arizona uh, work on a fiscal year, July 1st through June 30th. So we need to have our budget ready over the next few months so it can be adopted before J July 1st. So kind of keep that in mind as we're going, um, uh, going forward. All right, everybody's okay? We're going to keep moving along in that case. Um, as the city manager and the assistant city manager have told you in the first couple of weeks, um, oh, I'm sorry, here, you want me to do it? Okay. Um, the city does really depend on sales tax for a big chunk of its revenue um, because there is not uh, a portion of your property tax going to the municipality. So that makes our economic development and the Economic Development Office, a very, very uh, critical part of the city. So we are very lucky here uh, in the city of Apache Junction because we have uh, a woman who has been with the city now for 13 years, uh, became director of the Economic 19? Oh, 19, I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong number. 19 years? She, she started when she was 12. Um, has been a director since 2016, um, holds a master's in public administration from Northern Arizona University, and a bachelor's in business uh, administration from the University of St. Francis in Illinois. She has now uh, become a certified economic developer through the International Economic Development Council, uh, and also earned, just in the last year, the designation of Arizona Economic Development Professional which means she works very closely with a lot of those folks who want to come and do business in this city, who want to move to this city, who want to do develop in, development in this city. And she can tell you all about that. And it is a challenge. We're you know, at the far end of the Phoenix metropolitan area. That is a challenge in and of itself. The city is a different demographic than other places, certainly in the Valley and throughout Arizona. That is a challenge. And I'm sure she'll touch on any of those things if you uh, would like to know more, but she's going to tell you all about how we go about doing economic development in the city of Apache Junction, which is very, very important, as I said. But luckily, we have the best economic development director in the land, Janine Solly. <laughs> thank you, Al. All right. I am, uh, uh, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm so, so pleased to uh, talk to you a little bit about economic development. But I always want to thank this group in particular because I think you are folks that care about your community, you want to take time to learn about your community, and um, I just think that's so critical. Get involved. Um, thank you for your time and that you're investing in this. I think it's going to pay off big. 
I also tend to be very chatty, so I want to try to stick to my script. Jeff, quit laughing. Uh, I'm going to try to stick to my script as best I can so I'm not, uh, don't make the next speaker late. But if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to jump in. Happy to answer any questions. And I'm also going to set myself a timer. That's how bad I am. If I don't keep myself on track, I uh, get too far off track. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Al, I'll do my own slides if that's yep, okay. So I want to just kind of start with you with a little overview of what economic development is because not everybody always uh, defines it the same way. So what we do in economic development is really identify what our community's strengths and opportunities are. We identify partnerships uh, throughout the state and the, um, the, the region to find out how we can partner with them and achieve our vision. We um, support our existing businesses to see if they can, um, if they have any needs that are unmet, if we can identify resources, and particularly try to get them to expand at some point in time. Um, we also work with recruiting new businesses into the community, whether it be somebody who is starting with a clean slate, a raw piece of dirt and they want to build something, or folks that come in and want to do redevelopment or have limited funds and want to do a, a different kind of development. We work with all kinds of people, but it's all about investment in the community. And um, truly at its core though, economic development is about jobs. It's about creating jobs uh, and creating wealth in the community. And so ultimately that um, just creates great opportunity and enhances quality, quality of life for everybody. So in the world of economic development, you'll hear terms uh, like these, retention, expanse, expansion, and attraction. You hear that quite a bit. I usually get dry mouth, but for some reason I am. Um, maybe it's the mask. Uh, attraction is probably what you hear about most when you see something in the news or you say, you know, Nike landed in Glendale or Google is here or, you know, that's attraction. When you are bringing somebody from outside your community in. Super important, super critical. It raises the uh, jobs in the community. It's capital investment for the community. It, it can increase business to business. It can increase supply chain and bring other businesses to the community. So very, very important. Also really important though, and sometimes overlooked are the retention and the expansion opportunities uh, in economic development. And that's all about having policies and programs and partnerships in place that are a good fit for your community. They always say bird in the hand, a business in your community, it's much easier to hold on to them rather than attract a new one. So 2020, of course we all know, has been a, an unusual year, but it has actually been a great textbook example of how retention can work and how local strategies can help businesses uh, within your community. So as it was for everybody, economic development had to take a little bit of a shift and we didn't quite do business as usual uh, during the pandemic because on the attraction end of things, uh, you saw industry events that were canceled, typical uh, times when you'd get together with um, people that you would network with and inform about your community and say, hey, come take a look. Those were all off the, sh off the table. Uh, everything started to become virtual. It's much harder to make connections with people when you're virtual rather than face-to-face. -face. Um, and decision makers were really pressing pause. They aren't ready to make a decision that's going to impact their business's, you know, potential success uh, when there's still uncertainties and bumps in the road ahead. So um, we also had hard-hit sectors, as we all know. Tourism was hit hard. Restaurants were hit hard. Services and some retail were hit hard. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I guess, we have a lot of those um, hard hit sectors here in Apache Junction. So in order to help those businesses, we had to really take a look as the uh, pandemic just persisted. We said, we need, we need to help these folks, what can we do? So we focused kind of instead of on um, long-term retention, what immediately could we do for our local businesses um, to give them, a, give, give them a hand? So in May, I think it was, uh, it was very evident the pandemic was going to go on for some time. The mayor declared a state of emergency for the city, and um, we knew there were going to be unprecedented challenges that we had to overcome, and that included our business community. So we started immediately to implement some policies, some very simple, some a little bit more complex, all geared, though, to help those small businesses survive just through this time. Uh, we started to allow usage of private messaging on the city marquee downtown. Typically, that's not allowed. 
uh, we started to allow signage. Uh, normally where code might go knock on your door and say, yeah, hey, you have too many banners out or you have too many fin flags, get them down. We just said, put them out all you need. If you need to let people know you're open, put those flags out. We started to use our city's social media to promote businesses. So if they'd tag us in a promotion, we'd re-tag them and so it would get, get out to their audience. That's not something we typically did bef before, but was pretty easy uh, and, and low cost to do. Um, we had an A-frame signage program that we actually loaned some of our parks and rec signs. Uh, uh, very early on, you may recall, when restaurants um, and the, the um, mandates started coming down, Sometimes they'd close, sometimes they were temporarily closed, sometimes they were only open for curbside pickup. That was just changing daily. So we said, hey, we will give you signs, we'll loan you signs, we'll make the signs for you, so you can at least put them out front, so when customers are driving by, they'll at least know if you're open or not, or to what capacity. Uh, there were some more complex things, as I mentioned, like the city council passing a resolution that actually allowed the extension of outdoor seating areas. So what normally would used to be a parking place, if a business uh, was mandated by the state to keep three tables closed and open every fourth table, they lost the capacity to serve those customers. So the city council approved resolutions to say, hey, go set tables up outside. We're okay with that. Um, so those are some of the things we did. And then as time went on, by summer, we're realizing this is not going away and we need to maybe do something more. Um, CARES Act funding became available to local municipalities around that time, and this was a big one. Our city council voted to uh, utilize a portion of those funds to help our small businesses and some of our nonprofits. They recognize that they're the backbone to the community, that they create jobs, and importantly, they create sales tax revenues. So to keep them healthy and vibrant, they were willing to make that investment in those businesses. So we opened up a grant with over a million dollars allocated to the businesses um, to assist with rent, utility, and cost of PPP reimbursement. So if they had to buy personal protective equipment, if they had to buy fiberglass, uh, plexiglass, um, you know, dividers, we could reimburse for that up to 10,000. And um, most of our applicants were small businesses. As you can see from here, it was 87%, 13% were nonprofits, but in total we were able to assist 84 entities uh, in the community. So just so you can understand the kinds of businesses that needed and received the funding, I just kind of broke it down here into the general business category based on their primary deliverable. Uh, restaurant and retail are pretty self-explanatory. Service businesses that took advantage of it were um, beauty shops, insurance agents, skilled laborers, plumbers, day spas. Uh, all of those folks that really were hurting because they couldn't have customers in their stores. So, um, you know, their revenues were way down. Um, but you could see from that then, you know, we've got over 50% of them were service-based. Uh, in terms of the overall grants, our smallest grant award was just over $750 and we maxed out at 10,000 for 33 of the 84 maxed out. Our average overall award was uh, almost $6,900, and we were able to grant out um, $577,000 in the local economy. Uh, we know now, though, some of the businesses are continuing to struggle. Um, they're either having a, a slower than usual winter, being uh, due to the fact that some of the winter visitor numbers are down, as someone mentioned. Um, as uh, Others still have ongoing state mandates that they're trying to navigate and keep their business going. Um, with restrictions in place. So we recently launched this new initiative. It is a partnership with a tech company. They're actually out of Tempe. They're called Hound, and they are a platform designed to generate more foot traffic into brick and mortar businesses. And they focus on kind of um, uh, like either day spas or restaurants, um, entertainment type venues. They don't necessarily look for attorneys or, you know, they're, they're more kind of the fun, in the fun game or where you go, you know, try to dine out or something like that. We are covering the cost 100% uh, for any business that wants to participate through the end of this program. Um, this program that we're learning, and of course we're trying to implement things we think will help, what we've learned from this program is it relies on a business already having a social presence so if they have a website, if they have email distribution lists, if they have um, um, 
social media accounts. That all ties into this hound as, as, as another means to get the information out. What we're learning, uh, because our participation rate is lower than we'd hoped, is not all of our businesses even kind of have those basics. So this is one learning opportunity for us to say, wow, didn't realize so many of them couldn't even participate with this because they don't have that basic foundation. That's maybe the next program we need to look at. How can we get them caught up, if you will, uh, because really they're a little bit behind if they haven't implemented some of those things. So this is a tool that's going to work for some, but not for all. Um, kind of back to more traditional economic development activities, um, pre-COVID and hopefully soon post-COVID, economic development truly is kind of a, a statewide and a regional team game. Um, it's, it's, we can't do everything here alone in Apache Junction. That's why all of these folks listed on this sheet here are, uh, we participate with. The Arizona Commerce Authority is probably the largest organization. They are actually the state's arm for economic development, and what they do is international and national recruitment of business to come to Arizona. They're usually looking for the big fish out there uh, to land in Arizona. Um, GPEC, or Greater Phoenix Economic Council, is kind of more of our regional economic development agency. They service the Greater Phoenix metro area primarily Maricopa County. I don't know if any of you know, we're actually dual counties. We are primarily Pinal County, but we have a little toe print over the line into Maricopa County off of Meridian. Because of that little um, toe print we have over there, we're able to participate with GPAC uh, in their efforts as well. So we, along with 22 other member communities and dozens of private sector uh, folks, participate as members of GPAC. And um, they also go out and they do international recruitment. They do a lot of California recruitment because the business environment in California is getting really tough. So they actually have offices over there and they're talking to people every day about why Arizona might be a good move. Um, the others we work with kind of at a more county or uh, local level where we understand a little bit more about the dynamics of each community and what we're looking for. So those are great partners. I will say though, Arizona Commerce Authority and GPAC are the two primary um, ways that we get le business leads that are looking to move to Arizona. So they'll put out um, an RFQ or something for the communities and say, hey, this business is coming, they're gonna have X number of employees, their capital investment is gonna be this, and we need a building of this size, and what can you give us? They then put the site selection panel together, they take people on tours of communities along with the community members, and um, go from there. Our challenge with GPAC and ACA right now is we don't have a whole lot of inventory for them to look at, so it's very difficult when some of these larger companies come in and they're looking to locate in Arizona. We, we don't always have something to throw into the um, ring in terms of what they can consider. So we're working on that and I'm gonna touch on that here. Um, we do engage with these groups though in ways that we're able. So no two communities will do economic development the same because each community has its own unique characteristics and its own unique opportunities and strengths um, so I just put this up here as a quick little example of a very, very basic, um, you know, overview of what a business might initially look at in terms of what Apache Junction is all about. Because they don't, they love, they love our mountain too, I'm sure, but they may have never even been out here to see it. So on paper, they have to look at us and say, what does this community look like and is it a good fit for us? So um, why is this data relevant? We know, and I'm gonna use this as an example, I'm gonna look at our median age there. I don't know if y'all can see that. Our median age here in, in uh, Apache Junction is 52.2. So if there's a business coming to look uh, in the area, they're gonna need a workforce. So they're gonna say to themselves, okay, if I, if I locate here, where am I gonna get my employees from? Am I gonna have enough employees to you know, manage uh, my business here? And when you look at a 52-year-old average age, those folks are getting, they're looking at the finish line, you know? They're, they're, when am I gonna get out of this workforce? When you have a community that has maybe younger folks that are just starting their careers or, you know, it's, all that comes into play. So, um, and it's very, this one's just very unique to us because, and I bring this one up, this age um, one, because if you look at our competing cities, 
And we don't normally say cities that we compete with, but truly we are. We're competing with our regional neighbors, with the East Valley. If a business is looking to locate, they'll just as much look in Gilbert as they will in Apache Junction, as they will in Tempe, to see wh who has what we need. So if you wanted to take a look, anybody want to guess what the median age is in Mesa? Okay, just shout them out. Okay, how about Gilbert? 30? Okay, so just for uh, giggles, Mesa's 35.9, Gilbert's 33.9, Queen Creek is 34.1. Now they're getting old because a couple years ago they were 29, so they're aging quickly. <laughs> Phoenix is 33.8, and the U.S. median age is 38. So when you look at our neighboring communities and even median age across the U.S., we're a little older. And that shouldn't be a surprise because we, we kind of, that's, we, we were known as a retirement community. We've, we had opportunities for people who wanted to retire in a beautiful place. Yes, ma'am. That's interesting, and probably when the next census numbers come out, we could probably do an analysis of that if you, if you take those you know, 55 and over out of that. And that only, by the way, includes our full-time employees. Our winter numbers about double during the seasonal months have. This year is probably going to be a little bit different. So this is just full-time employees, but good question. Yes, ma'am. it will start to decrease. And I think part of that reason is the city council made a deliberate decision many years ago to not um, encourage or approve age-restricted communities in Apache Junction anymore. Not that they, we don't want people of all ages, they're welcome, but you just can't restrict a community to 55 plus anymore. That does a couple of things for us. When they're age-restricted, they don't always support your school system because their kids are already out of school. They don't always live here full time. So when you don't have a city property tax and those people aren't paying year round whether they're here or not, they're only contributing to your library during the months they're here. But you gotta run that library 12 months out of the year. So there are reasons that it's good to have families move into the community because it's just more well-rounded. It will diversify our um, you know, demographics greatly if we you know, stick to that plan, invite more families to come into the community and, and just balance it out. And it will start to come down. It will start to come down. In fact, our median household income just a couple years ago was only at about 38. So we're, we're moving on up in that direction, which is a good thing because for retailers uh, or service industries, that's a number they want to see up, you know. And if, and if you compare ourselves to other, some of the other communities that we just went through, we, we are a little weaker in that household income as well. But that will improve as well. And that's another thing. Household income will improve when you don't have retirees the more families you have and maybe two adults working in a household, that number is really going to shoot up. So diversification is important for us. I see Fox arrived, so I'm already running behind. Yes, sir. So we have 152 mobile home parks in the city of Apache Junction. At last count, I heard of, Fox may know better than me, but um, I believe the number was 152. I think that they don't hurt our economy other than for the reasons I just said, they're not here typically full time. They, those parks have a tremendous boost. Most of them are 55 plus. So a lot of them are seasonal. Um, they have a tremendous boost. You talk to many of our businesses and they'll say, we couldn't get through a summer if we didn't have our winters. Like, you know, they, they couldn't keep their business here if those winter visitors didn't come. So they're critical for us. They're critical. And I don't know, they get very involved. They're actually very um, they're, um, volunteers. They're, you know, they're great for the community. They do great things. And they get a lot of, they, you know, every time somebody's honking at a, you know, snowbird on the road, I'm always waving to them. Because, you know, I'm, I'm happy you're here. <laughs> Thanks for being here. So they're important. Um, okay, I'm going to keep going here. Fox, I'm going to try to go fast. Um, 
The good news about, though, our demographic here is we don't, and no community does, rely on for business, trying to recruit business to the community to say, you will only employ people within our municipal boundaries. That doesn't happen, we all know that. So we kind of look at a 30 minute commute, commute shed so we can tell businesses, hey, in Apache Junction we may only have you know, 12,000 people in our workforce, but within a 30 minute commute shed you have access to X number of millions or however. So Apache Junction is the, uh, represented by the little yellow star on the map. The yellow line is approximately a 30 minute commute shed, which is considered a reasonable commute somebody would be willing to drive. And then uh, you see the freeway system in there and you also see the blue dots and the blue dots are where the major employment centers are and the larger the dot, the more the concentration of jobs are located in that area. So you see we don't have too many blue dots out here and that's what we need to change in the future for AJ. Uh, this is just another a graph that demonstrates how jobs relate to your place of residence. So we've got uh, 14,000, I think I just said 12, 14,000 people in Apache Junction who currently participate in the workforce. Um, there's only about 1,300 though, or a little less than 10% that actually live here and work here. That means 90% of the people that live in our community have to drive elsewhere and out of town to go to work. This is not uncommon for outskirt communities, just so you know, it's not weird for us, because as you saw on that map, all of the larger employment centers are more centric to downtowns and you know, the freeway corridors. Um, but this does teach us that we have to start to consider strategies about how do we get more of those job centers here in Apache Junction, and especially with that state land to the south, finally gonna break free, that's our greatest opportunity. So I want to talk a little bit about what drives and, and what, um, you know, how, how do we come up with our work plan of what we do. The City Council adopted what's called, uh, we call it EDAPT, um, about 13 years ago. It's well overdue for a refresh, uh, but a lot of the, the, the information in it still holds true. Um, and it was really a grassroots initiative that said at the time, and as this community, here's our strengths and our weaknesses, and what really should we be able to focus on to help enhance and you know, grow um, Apache Junction. If you take that study and you just boil it down to its three most basic components, you'll find it talks a lot about diversification. Uh, this has been mentioned before, there's a strong recognition we have too much of a heavy reliance on our winter visitors. We have to figure out how do we diversify that and make the other months just as strong. We, um, and we also rely way too heavily on sales tax. Since we don't have a city property tax, guess what, sales tax. And as the valley has come closer and closer and closer, and I always call it my nemesis, Signal Butte, all of that shopping, how easy is it for people, especially those folks that live along US 60, it's quicker for them to get to Signal Butte on the freeway than it is to come down here. So um, very, very fragile for us, a lot of eggs in one basket. Um, we also talk in the EDAP plan about downtown, that downtown is, is, uh, is an opportunity. It was never built as a downtown. In fact, people say sometimes, where is your downtown? Because it's not what they're used to uh, in their hometowns, you know, where you'd park and you'd window shop and you'd have Christmas decorations. It is six lanes of traffic, a super wide median, and all the buildings are set way back. That's our downtown. So um, we need, they, they're like, you need to figure out how to make that more downtowny. Um, and then destination, no one can deny we have a phenomenal mountain sitting out there. And it's an opportunity, it's not going away. That's our one thing. You know, I, always, if I tease Florence because they always thought they had the prison as their big employer. Well, guess what? It might go away. Our mountain is not going to, it's gonna stay there. So how do we take advantage of that asset but make it meaningful and have an economic impact here in Apache Junction? People drive through AJ all the time. How do we get them to stop and stay? So I'm gonna go through the first one real quick, the diversification. Um, that means we need more living wage jobs in Apache Junction. There's retail, there's tourism, there's service industry, and they don't always pay very well. So if we can focus on attracting jobs to the community that have a living wage, we will do ourselves a big favor in the long run. Just a couple of examples, and because we've got so much BLM and state land in Apache Junction, it's very hard to find parcels that are easy to 
uh, sell and, and get a developer in and, and build on. These are two examples, though. The one over here at Tomahawk and Baseline was approved a few years ago. It's actually the t perfect type of uh, industry we'd like to see more of here. It's a standard, standard manufacturer. They make awnings. They make outdoor playground equipment. And I will tell you, some of the challenges, though, with the community is uh, we, we don't have a, a lot of infrastructure in place to handle these things. They needed natural gas to operate their plant. And it, anybody want to take a guess at what it costs to get one gas line from the freeway down to that site on the corner? Quarter million dollars. So that was their first hill. We're, okay, we didn't plan on a quarter million dollars, $250,000, just to get a gas line, just to the site. That's not doing anything else. So we're trying to work with them on finding some funding. Uh, and then there was some things well with outside of our control, uh, federal tax tariffs on, on, on steel and uh, that was a little bit of a hurdle. And then the company itself actually did an acquisition. So they had uh, an expansion, and um, that tied up some of their finances for a little while. So we're anticipating they're going to come back online, which is a great thing for us. It's just, it's not in our time, it's in their time. The other one, though, uh, over at Idaho and US 60 is a great opportunity. That is um, 40 acres of industrial that was recently rezoned. We are working with a developer right now who is considering doing some spec development. U-Haul owns that site. U-Haul is going to have to sell that site to the developer in order to get that to happen. We are trying to work through that right now. Yes, ma'am. So if it's if it's on that if it's on that site, it's probably already come through me. Um, we do the recruitment and then we almost hand it off to development services, if you will. So they're probably waiting for approval on a site plan or building permits and things like that. So once they're on the site, I will tell you there's a lot of things that I work on that you may never hear about, probably 90%. 90% comes to the table, we try to work on it, they can't find a place, we try, try, try. Some of it's, you know, many years in the making. We'll tell you the Grand Hotel site has been under contract for two years. We've been working on that to try to get that to happen. They still can't get it to pencil. They're trying to bring other equity partners in, and that's like things outside our control. We're trying to figure out ways that we can uh, reduce impact fees because there used to be a building, and how can, you know, how can we offset some of that? So we try as a city to come up with what we can do to get those projects to work, but there's only so much we can do, and the private sector really has to step up. So good question. I'm going to move on because I'm running way out of time. Um, future employment opportunities, I do want to touch on this one just quickly because this is where it's critical for Apache Junction's future. We have the opportunity to pivot and really become a player, really get some industry out here, really get some great jobs. This is just a, a um, ADOT map that they have on their web page. It shows just a, um, I think it was a, what did they call it, a preferred route map when they're looking at the north-south corridor and the 24 where that's going to come over, which is already under construction, this is where we've got an opportunity to really consider what land uses do we want? What, what are we going to allow to be built on the freeway? Is it going to be homes? Is it going to be industry? Is it, what is it going to be? Is it going to be park model you know, units that we see? It, it, we, we, this is where our opportunity is. All you need to do is take a ride up the 101. If you haven't been down the 303, the new Loop 303 lately, take a ride. There are thousands of jobs being created with big industry coming in because that's where they want to be. We're at the cusp of that right here, but we've got to be smart about it. Um, okay, so the other thing, this is a fun one, um, that the EDAP strategy talked about was uh, continued downtown investment. I'm going to zip through this really quick, though, because um, it's, it, it's important. We have some tired and older looking buildings. We need to reinvest in those things. Uh, we've got some ripe development opportunities, redevelopment opportunities that really can enhance Apache Junction, and it's good for all of us. So I'm going to go through and do a little quiz. Anybody recognize this or tell me what location this was in? Do, 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 do. Okay, clue number two coming your way. This is the same location, it's just a different building. Do, 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 do. Oh my gosh, really? This was and now is the Old West Marketplace. This is where Fry's is. So that used to exist, the old 
broken down RNS fence building and the old gas station, the Chevron, that sat literally vacant on that corner, boarded up, looking so tired. And frankly, for all those people who would come through our community to get to the mountains, that's the impression we left. Now people come through, I can't tell you how many people say, wow, that fries. Like people who haven't been out here in a while, they really notice the difference. I'm gonna tell you too, this, so it's a grocery store. People say it's a grocery store. It's not a big employer, right? It did bring some jobs. It brought some new retail. It brought some new restaurants. Borrows Pizza's going in. I don't know if you've all heard that yet. Um, so it is, it, it's, it's important for us, but it's really important because look at that, look at all those shoppers in that store. That is sales tax. We don't have a property tax, that sales tax is critically important for us. So that's another reason. If I was, I would be very remiss if I didn't tell all of you, shop AJ, please, whenever you're able to. Matt talked about sales tax revenues being up this past year. I believe part of that is because people who maybe used to go over, over to Kohl's to shop are just on their computer now ordering at home. And guess what? Our residents used to go shop there and pay Mesa's, police officers, library, whatever, now, when they're shopping online, thanks to the state changing the law, a portion of that's coming back to the city. So if they're shopping in their living room now, I love it. I love it because we get a little piece of that pie instead of giving it to somebody else. So shop AJ when you can, please. Um, another redevelopment quiz. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Redevelopment quiz. Here we go. Where is this boring and sad looking stretch of roadway? Do, 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 do. And at one time, it used to lead to these beautiful, boarded up and dilapidated duplexes. Do, do, do. North Apache Trail. So, what is it today? It is North Apache Trail. Yes, ma'am. It is not, so Phelps Drive ends at Apache Trail Old West Highway where they meet. It's on the, the right hand, where do they meet? The south side. Correct. Where do they think that starts? Yes, and then, north, and then it's North Apache Trail to the north. This is super cool. Uh, we not only have started to add and implement, um, you know, elements of your more traditional downtown, wider sidewalks, street lights, where you feel like you want to go, um, we've narrowed the roadway there, which a lot of people screamed about. They hate the speed limit, but you know what? It is a great addition. Now the park is there. People can go. There's events. Of course, after COVID, we'll have them again. But what we have to do here, this is to me, a, a, this is a great redevelopment story because downtowns are all about creating, inviting, attractive, and vibrant places where people want to go. Who would ever want to drive and stop when it was boarded up buildings and you know a dirt, nobody. But when you create this and you've got somebody that's driving through town and knows there's an event happening in Apache Junction, they may stop and they may next time say, hey, there's Tipsy Cow, we, let's go check that restaurant out or the next time we come through to go for a hike or something. So it's all about creating vibrancy. Downtowns are ghost towns without people. So everything that we can do to really create vibrancy is going to help our downtowns. Um, those two examples I give you because the city was directly involved in those, either with land swaps or uh, selling right of way or things like that. We did development agreements. Um, that's why I told you about those two. All other opportunities that we have in town, we try to keep a top 10 infill site list available for developers. So if somebody comes in and they're looking for, hey, I have this business, or hey, I'd like to do a small you know, residential development, or this is kind of what we use to steer them to get started and then we work with their special needs after uh, you know, we know more. I will also point out here there are a couple of uh, dashed outlines that represent redevelopment areas. So what the city has done is pre-establish redevelopment areas in town, which means the city wants investment to occur there. These areas meet a certain criteria. Um, you know, they don't have enough sidewalks or they don't, you know, it's a low income population or, or they need investment essentially is what it boils down to. So when the city is able to get grants that m removes one hurdle, it's easier to get grants in these areas because it's already been pre-established. But the other thing importantly it does for the private investment community is it tells them we as a city care about these areas and we want good things to happen here. It makes them feel a little bit better about, is this a little risky? But you know what, the city's got you know, their skin in the game too, so it's worth it. 
Um, and then the last thing, Fox, I'm so sorry, uh, is tourism. That's what EDAP talked about. And we're, like I said, we're blessed to have the mountain. Uh, if I took a survey in this room, I would bet at least half of you said I moved here because of the mountain or I was drawn to the area because of the mountain. Uh, we hear that all the time. And um, a business might, might not make a decision to locate here because that's pretty, but a tourist certainly would come out here because they said, I saw a picture of that. I want to go see that. I want to go hide that. heard that hike is amazing. So that is uh, great for us. And why does all of that matter for tourists? The premise is if we can get visitors out here to this area, they'll stop, they'll shop, they'll dine, they'll stop at the museum, they'll stop at the, you know, at the local brew pub, whatever. Um, and that helps our local business community. And the other thing that's really important about tourists is they import money into the community. Money that is, would never circulate through this community now is because they were here. So we've done some, um, uh, some great work with the Office of Tourism with the help of our very talented Matt McNulty, if you've not met him yet, um, over the years. This is just a sample of some print ads that we've done. Uh, we did do a, I'll just mention briefly, a very limited uh, tourism study some years ago to find out where our tourists were coming from so we'd better understand how we market to them. Uh, we found out with no surprise, and it was done over the winter months, that the majority came from um, the Midwestern states. But the second and third most populated uh, locations that came to visit us were Phoenix and Tucson, folks from Phoenix. So we knew, hey, we've got a local market here that's interested in what we have. Let's try to take advantage of that. So that one there, too, is a, um, a billboard, actually, that was up on the I-10 to try to get that local Tucson and Phoenix traffic to, you know, just top of mind. It's always about elevating awareness about Apache Junction and making people know that we're out here. Uh, we've done, uh, that's a, on the left side there, Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. We did some backlit signage. I can't tell you how much positive feedback we got from those. They were pretty spectacular. And then you've probably been around town long enough to see uh, some of our Apache Junction uh, bags. Matt actually designed a series of those too. I'll mention at this time, we do fund through the Economic Development Department the um, Visitor Center. So annually, we do a contract to have someone in the community provide Visitor Center services. The Arizona Office of Tourism has a, a formal program. Uh, it's been historically the Chamber of Commerce that has done that for us, and we pay them uh, an annual fee. They see about, well, not 2020, but tens of thousands uh, of visitors through that door every year. So uh, they are our ambassadors for telling people what's great to see in the community, where they could go eat and shop, uh, and it's right in the heart of downtown. So if you want to stop at the visitor center, you're gonna see everything else that's out there. It's not on the freeway or something where somebody can keep on driving by. They have to come to downtown. Um, okay, and I'm gonna uh, close here um, with one of my favorites. This is something we did last year, and we actually wrapped up this video just at the end of February. Um, where we hired a contractor com to come out and do a tourism video for us. Um, it was our intention to wrap this up and launch it um, before the 2020 winter season. While people are starting to make travel plans, we wanted to get this video out in front of them um, so that they would make us part of their destination. Unfortunately, of course, COVID happened. People stopped traveling. People quit planning because they didn't know what's ahead. So we pulled back. We'll still use this, it's, it's not you know, time sensitive, so we will still use it to try to get people to come here and, and look at it and visit Apache Junction. This is about a two and a half minute video that I'm gonna play here. We actually have about three others <clears throat> that are 30 seconds. <laughs> that there's an undiscovered gold mine here in the Superstition Mountains, and we love mystery, and we love gold, so we're here to check it out for ourselves. So we're going for a ride into the Superstition Mountains. And remember that undiscovered gold mine? Well, we haven't found it yet, but we have learned that it's called the Lost Dutchman Mine. Many people have gone missing in search of the gold, and the Apaches believe that it's protected by the Thunder God. Who really knows? But we can find more answers at the Superstition Mountain Museum. Or the Goldfield Ghost Town. We just finished up lunch in downtown Apache Junction. 
And now we're gonna hit the road for a scenic drive. Maybe with some stops along the way? We're definitely stopping along the way. All right, let's go. Good morning. Just leaving camp for a quick morning ride before the annual Lost Dutchman Days. Apparently we chose the right weekend to be here because it only happens once a year. See you later. This weekend has been such a blast. Next time we need to go hiking and get out on the water. And we didn't strike gold, but we found even more reasons to come back to Apache Junction. Thank you for watching And that concludes my presentation. I know I've run way over. I'm sorry, I would love to stay for questions. If you have any quick ones, um, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, my contact information is up there. Feel free to contact me anytime with any questions, any suggestions. Love to hear from our community about what you think priorities should be and what's important and what you think is you love about Apache Junction that we should be sharing because we're trying our best to sell the community to a variety of audiences. So we'd love to hear from all of you. We did not. Um, we, we actually had, um, and I will tell you, I was very humbled uh, because we did a lot of outreach to our businesses when that happened to let them know it was available. I was humbled at how many of them said, you know what, I bet there are others that need it more. We're probably going to be okay. We'll take a pass. It was amazing to me. I just, I mean, it almost brings tears to my eyes. And I will tell you, when the city council approved the funding for that, they at the same time stipulated that anything that went unclaimed or unspent uh, would go to the police department because the CARES Act funding truly was for public safety. Um, they rationalized that the, it was in the best interest in the public safety's welfare um, to supply this grant to the businesses, though, because they're the backbone. If we had businesses starting shuttering up, we wouldn't be able to pay police department bills anymore, you know? So th there, there was a solid rationale behind it, but because it was intended for public safety, they, they had to go there. I wish, and I, I planted a seed, um, well, Pinal County has some funding that they're using and doing the same thing. They're using general fund money for it, though. I said, hey, can you extend that into municipalities? Or is it, it's, currently it's just unincorporated areas. And I also wish that we could have retained that money and done a second round. Uh, we just didn't have the option to do that because now that this has gone on and on longer, that was in the summertime, remember, now that we got into November and December and now that there's a slower season, I get a lot of calls and I get a lot of concerns when I visit with businesses to say, we're having a hard time. And I'm getting calls now saying, do you have any, is there any in the, around the funding? And I have to say no. Thankfully, PPP opened up again for the federal program. That's forgivable if you spend 60% on your employee costs, retention costs, um, it's, so it's an option. So at least there's something out there for them now, but it's just not at the local level. Yeah, so the, the remainder went to PD. All right, thank you all. You're good, and I got it, I got it, and I got it, yeah. Um, okay, let's uh, go ahead and do a quick five minute break so everybody can uh, run to the bathroom, do whatever they need, and then we will do our last presentation of the evening, thank you.
I want to get you guys out of here, you know, before midnight. Come on now. Okay, for the online folks, get ready. Are we missing any? Who else are we missing? Do we have everybody? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Miss Smith, you want to introduce yourself real quick to the group? Yes, October, November, December, January. So this is the fifth edition, correct? Thank you, Ms. Smith. So um, in the last, I think, session of CLI, I actually go through a little bit of media, since of course that's my background. You know, I've been in, uh, in I was in media for almost 10 years before uh, I went to government, and I have been in media relations, public information, public relations, if you will, for government for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, one of the things I will, I will tell you is, up until right before the pandemic, we had a monthly paper and a weekly paper. We still had a weekly paper in Apache Junction um, that unfortunately uh, had to close during the, uh, right after the pandemic hit last year. And so we've been down to just the one monthly, uh, which also covers um, Gold Canyon and Queen Creek and now covers even Florence. So it's kind of gotten even more splintered in that way. So we now at least have a second monthly uh, publication in the city and um, that's always important for the demographic that you've learned all about. That demographic is used to getting at least some of its news from a traditional newspaper uh, kind of publication. So uh, one of the things that we will talk about when we get to that part of, of the class is a little bit about media, at least the traditional news media, since of course we get our news from so many different places now. Okay, we are going to uh, uh, finish up the night with our third uh, and uh, a, a different kind of presentation, or at least a different uh, a presentation from a different kind of department within a municipality or a government. This is not necessarily the case everywhere, and those who do it can do it in various ways. Sometimes it's done sort of separate from the city, sometimes it's done within the city, and different cities have a different um, uh, perspective on how to go about trying to bolster its uh, coffers to help the citizens of the city, um, but uh, Fox here is gonna tell you uh, all about that. And um, our presenter uh, for, for this part of the class has a background in parks and recreation, re re resource management, uh, has also worked in the nonprofit world, holds bachelor's degrees in anthropology and philosophy. Very logical. And um, uh, a master's in uh, uh, business administration, and in 2018 moved from the bluegrass state of Kentucky to become the program resource coordinator uh, for revenue development in uh, the city of Apache Junction. So to talk all about revenue development, here is Fox Young. Thank you, Al. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, as Al said, my name is Fox. I came from Kentucky a few years ago. Uh, I was hired in the city of Apache Junction, and I am going to try, I know we're running behind, so I'm going to try and keep this presentation as concise as I can. I know some people might have to get up early in the morning to go to work or have other obligations, so I will try and get you all out of here as quick as I possibly can while still giving you relevant information. All right, four things that the Revenue Development Department does, uh, city grants, we also do corporate partnerships. We deal with the nonprofit side, which is the Friends of Apache Junction, who are there. They're a revenue arm of the city. 
they're not with the city, they're their own organization, but they help supply funds for a lot of the programs uh, that the city runs, like Paws and Claws, if you've ever gone down there, the animal adoptions, uh, the Parks and Recs Department, they work very closely with that and help fund a lot of their programs, uh, the Police Department, and then we also have the Community Development Corporation, uh, which is, they've been around, but they didn't get a lot of notoriety until more recently when they started several programs uh, to help the community out, and I'll be going through those a little later. Uh, first, we're going to start with the grants, and all grants are as their external sources of revenue to address local needs. Uh, this might be if you need a road put in, you need to expand a road, uh, it's fallen into decay and you need to repave it. Uh, it might be something for the public library, uh, a program they're doing. One that's coming up is the storybook program uh, that they're gonna do in that project. So we're trying to get funding and we're doing some grants for that. There could also be something for Parks and Rec, maybe a new park. Um, I wasn't here, but Flatiron Park, I'm sure most of you know about that. It was put in not too, too long ago. A lot of grants were used for that, uh, reaching out to some of the local communities as well to get funds. Uh, it could also be something for the police department. Uh, they need something, you know, they need equipment. Uh, the police radios, those things cost anywhere from ten to twenty thousand a piece, so trying to have enough revenue for those is extremely difficult when you have to pay for staffing and you know retirements and everything that goes on in the police department on a daily basis. Budgets nowhere uh, really in the United States can keep up with that. So municipalities are always trying to look for other sources and grants specifically to help make up that uh, shortcoming. Grants can come in all different, or they can come from all different sources. Uh, it can be government or private. Uh, government resources can be federal, state, county. Uh, we don't do as many from the city, but they can be tiered. The government will give out money to the states, which can give it out to the counties. So you can apply for grants on multiple levels. There's also the private sector. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that give out grants. There's a lot of businesses. There's businesses in Apache Junction, Mesa, all throughout Phoenix that you can apply and get grants for as well. Not always the largest grants, but every bit helps, and you don't have as much competition for those grants. Some of the big federal grants, state grants, you can be going against thousands and thousands of people uh, who are also writing and trying to get that money. More localized grants, much easier to get. So it's a good resource, especially for some of the smaller projects or programs going on. Uh, nonprofits or foundations will also give out grants. So again, if you look, do your research, you can find some of those smaller grants uh, and apply for those to help bolster your income. These, there's a cycle to grants and it begins and ends with grant management and it's, really an entire system into itself. Sometimes multiple people work in this. Sometimes it's just one person who has to do everything. Uh, grant management, you have your research, you have your writing of the grant, the administration of the grant, and then the reconciliation of the grant, and that all ties back in to grant management. And I'm gonna go through each one of those. And grant management itself is just the overall management of the grant and the entire process. It really begins with the research. And the research is just gathering the information that's needed. It might sound easy, but a lot of times it's not because you have to reach out to other departments, other agencies, you have to wait for them to get information. Then you have to collate that information, get it all together, and then submit it. But that's not the whole thing. You also have to do research on who's actually um, doing the grant, so or what organization is offering the grant. So you gotta know what do they want? What do they wanna see on their grant? A uh, good thing to do is to look at past grants that were awarded, past organizations that were successful in their grant applications. Look at those, a lot of the grants, they'll list them so you can see what's been done and what's been done successfully. It'll cut down a lot of the headache 
and the uh, chances of not getting the grant. It raises your chances of getting that. Uh, the most important thing, though, is the writing of the grant. Uh, this is the make or break area. You can do all the research in the world, but if you can't write a decent grant and give them what they want, then you're never going to get a grant or they're going to be few and far in between. There's definitely an art to this. Uh, this is where your research comes in as well, knowing the organization or the entity, and then giving them what they want and there are certain keywords they might want or not want. And you need to know which ones those are. Uh, if you do your research and you're writing successfully, then comes the administration. You've received a grant. Um, just an example, let's say Parks and Recreation wanted to redo some tennis courts. So write a grant, do research, write a grant, you get awarded. Now the real fun begins because you have to distribute the funds, get everybody together, and tell them what they can and can't spend those funds for. <laughs> Sometimes that can be a very difficult part because they're like, oh no, we need it for this, we need it for that, and it's like, no, can't do that. It has to be used for the specific criteria from the organization that they said, you can only use it for this, this, and this. Everything goes perfectly, because we know everything goes perfectly, and state, city, federal government, and the project gets completed. Now comes the follow-up. This is where the reconciliation comes into play. You have to get all the information, all the receipts, put it together, do any follow-up reports. Sometimes the follow-up reports are done quarterly. Sometimes it's just at the end of the project. You send them all in, and then the cycle begins again, probably for about 10 other grants because they're always constantly in the work. You have to keep up. Uh, if you're not good with organization, probably grant writing is not gonna be uh, your cup of tea, because there's always something going on. All right, corporate partnerships. This gets a lot of questions, uh, but corporate partnerships give the city extra funds to expand events, programs, while helping businesses reach their marketing goals so the question would be, well, why would anybody or any business ever want to do this? And there's many, many reasons why a corporate partnership is really a smart way to go for your a business or even another agency, um, especially small business, because they're not going to necessarily have a marketing person. They're not going to necessarily have the time to spend to, okay, do we go online? Do we go print? Do we do both? Do we do you know, in person. So a partnership with the city enables them to sit back, not have to do any of that work, because the city as a partner, we want our programs and events to go off without a hitch. We want as many people there as possible. Uh, we'll use 4th of July uh, as an example. Big 4th of July event here probably gets, you know, as far as a city only event, some of the you know, biggest attendance. So there's a built-in audience there. There's a lot of money and time that the Parks and Recreation staff and other city staff put into the event. So a uh, business can tag along with that, partner up, and it makes it so that it's not very expensive for them in the long run. Because marketing is very expensive. There's also, by doing this, uh, it's an additional way for your brand to get noticed and recognized. Not everybody reads the paper, not everybody's on social media. Some people will, are linked in with the Parks and Recs Department or the Police Department. They stay current with those events and they go to those programs, they go to those events. So Parks and Recreation already has a list of all the people who go in that, they fast blast it out, they hit social media, they hit print media, and it's a prolonged amount of time. It's not just, hey, it's in the newspaper for a day. It's generally in there for days, weeks, even months at a time. Not only that, it goes in and you have a different clientele. Your business can meet face to face with uh, the general public or even other businesses. Uh, some of the things we did, and I witnessed back in Kentucky when we were doing these, is when you had multiple businesses sponsoring the same event, 
a lot of times they would get together and afterwards form partnerships that were beneficial to both businesses as well. And it's really good, especially these days. Uh, it's good publicity. And you know, it shows that you care about the community and you're willing to give back to the community. So it's really good. Many uh, reasons why you'd want to do it. Sponsorship levels generally start out at about $250 and go up from there depending upon the level of sponsorship you want. So, you know, try and find other advertising for that, and it's targeted as another main thing. You know, Fry's here, and I know they do corporate, you know, where it goes out all throughout the U.S., but Fry's here isn't going to get anybody from, say, Phoenix. They're not going to come out here and specifically go to Fry's. You know, if they were already out here for something else, they might stop in, but through corporate partnerships, they can really target people in the community and get them uh, into their business. Nonprofits. One of the jobs that we do is we work, and I specifically work as a liaison between several of the nonprofits and the city. I help them when they're doing uh, fundraisers or projects, programs uh, with the city, in conjunction with the city, when they're raising funds for city projects and programs uh, that are going on. So I help them navigate the government system, which can be daunting uh, if you've never dealt with it before. So it just helps them and it helps the city and it's a mutual benefit. The friends, and I'm gonna to have to read this directly from the uh, slide here, so I apologize for this. I don't have their mission memorized by heart. Uh, the Friends of Apache Junction exists to enhance the programs, facilities, and services of the community. They're an all-volunteer board. Uh, none of the board members are paid. They do it just because they want to give back to the city and to the community. And they give back 98% of all the donation money that's taken in. And actually, it's even higher than that because anything left over from you know, insurance, because they have to pay insurance, postage, you know, office supplies, things like that, they'll actually give anything left over from that back to the community as well. So really in total, they give about 98.5 to 99% of the money they take in back into the community, which is almost unheard of in the nonprofit sector. Uh, anywhere, some of them take up to 30, 40, 50% uh, just for their overhead. Some have gone even higher than that, but you know, the five to 10%, 15% is very, very common uh, in the nonprofit sector. In 2020, $74,500 was donated to the friends of uh, people in the community. This is one of the most giving communities I have ever seen. Uh, it is amazing how much people give here, um, especially since it's a smaller community on the outskirts of you know, a major, you know, obviously you have Phoenix, Scottsdale, uh, places like that. This year, the Friends provided over $46,500 in revenue back. That was from that $74,500. It seems a little skewed, but this year a lot of the programs had to be canceled or they had to be changed. So what happens to the money that's left over is it goes back in and it's held in specific accounts so that the money can only be used in the future for what it was donated for. So say somebody gave to Paws and Claws it wasn't used this year, it can be used at any time in the future for something for Paws and Claws. Or say it was given to the police department or Parks and Rec, uh, senior programs gets a lot of money. So the money that came in this year for senior programs, if it didn't get spent, it will get spent in the future only for senior programs. They have a website, and I'll pull up the websites really quickly at the end, uh, friendsofapachejunction.org. We just got it up and online no, not too, too long ago. So feel free to go there, learn more about the organization. Uh, feel free to donate. It's a secure website, which if you don't know, uh, the S on there, if you go to any nonprofit, look for that S if you're going to donate online. It just means it's a secure site. Uh, that way your information is protected on there. Okay. I basically do the same thing I do with the friends for the Apache Junction Community Development Corporation. And this one's longer. 
So the mission statement, working together to maintain and create safe, affordable housing, support economic opportunities, instill a sense of community pride and commitment, and enhance the physical image of Apache Junction. They have three major projects uh, that they focus on, and these were developed because there was a need in the community or some projects had fallen in the wayside or fallen to the wayside in the past, and they wanted to revive those and get those projects done uh, so they could move on and the city could move on to other things. And the first is the focal point, uh, which is between Fry's and Flatiron Park. I believe the street is uh, Apache Trail, right down there where it comes out. Uh, they also do the Make a Difference Day project, which started in 2019. And then the Community Revitalization Project, which is picking up a lot of steam here lately. The focal point, if you all hadn't seen it before, I'm sure probably everybody has. Janine had it in her presentation. Uh, it was a community enhancement project, and what it focused on is it gives like an identity to the downtown, uh, the business district. It's kind of like one of those areas where like, okay, here we are downtown, and everything sprawls out from that. Uh, it's commemorative brick area, so you can go get a commemorative brick. There's sections for um, veterans, the general public, and pets. If you have a beloved pet or veteran, uh, you know, definitely get a brick. They're, they're not too expensive. They're only $50. You can actually go online to the website. We just got that live. You can actually see your brick and type it out as you're going along. And I'm going to show that a little later just because it's kind of cool. Uh, there's also the Make a Difference Day. This started in 2019, and there hadn't been a coordinated event of this type uh, in a long time. They wanted to get various organizations together with the city and do you know, enhancement projects for the community. This could involve tree planting, uh, trail work. Uh, last year, they did uh, some work up at Silly Mountain on the Botanical Walk uh, and spruced that area up. They worked on the focal point, got that all cleaned up, removed all the weeds from there. And they also go out to individuals who are having a hard time maintaining their lawns. You know, maybe they're elderly, disabled, you know, on a fixed income. So they help them as well maintain their property. Oh, uh, real quick. I believe the next event is going to for Make a Difference Day is October 9th of this year and it generally runs from eight until noon. You can volunteer for that. Uh, one caveat, COVID, so we don't know. It's a long way off, but we'll, the website will keep people up to date on you know, COVID and you know, any precautions they're taking uh, for that event, which is generally what the CDC is recommending, mass social distancing, uh, things like that. This past year, they, the first year they had 135 people volunteer this past year, they had to scale way back because they needed to keep people separated. So they uh, capped it at 30, and I think we ended up with 32 because we had an extra little project in there at the end. Uh, so we'll wait to see what happens this year. The revitalization project. Uh, this actually stemmed from Make a Difference Day. There was such a demand uh, to help people who Again, were elderly, they couldn't uh, maintain their yards, they were on a fixed income, and things, you know, over time, things can pile up. I know I have a room that has uh, way more than it should <laughs> in there that every weekend I sit there, I'm like, yeah, I need to get on this, and something else comes up. Uh, so they started this project, and what you can do is you can go online or call, email, so maybe you know somebody who needs help uh, in your neighborhood, or you yourself might need some help. Uh, we help out with a lot of code cases uh, with the city, people who just don't have the means uh, anymore. You know, medical situations happen. You know, people get, you know, lose a job, things like that. So the AJCDC will step in and they'll clean up an area they'll help them you know with general yard maintenance they helped one gentleman fix the roof and get the roof fixed and i'm going to give a shout out to efficient roofing uh, because they came in uh, he was a world war ii veteran and had a, 
huge hole in his roof and AJCDC called out, Efficient Roofing answered that call. They came in, they fixed his roof for free. Didn't charge him a thing. So amazing, amazing thank you uh, to them for that. And there's other businesses uh, who help as well. Uh, Kabat's Ace Hardware has stepped up and helped out with these projects, especially the Make a Difference Day. And please, I'm, I know I'm going to forget a bunch of people. Uh, Modern Woodmen have also done that. There's so many. Uh, I probably should have made a list of that. So next time I will definitely do that. I apologize to anybody else. The latest project, this was uh, the yard that they were at, the property. And doesn't look like much there. It was over nine tons of material on this property. That is over 18,000 pounds that was taken out, trash and debris, that we were able to send out to the dump. That's what it looks like now. And those happen every month. Sometimes there's multiple projects like this going on at the same time. This was one of the larger ones, uh, but you know, just tremendous. So, and they're really doing, a, want to give a shout out to the AJCDC. They have done tremendous work with this so far and have helped a lot of people. It's not just good for the homeowner, but for the neighbors and the neighborhood itself to, you know, clean up the properties. So thank you AJCDC for that. Uh, their website, patchyjunctioncdc.com. And sorry, I forgot to change the heading on this one because I was copy and pasting slides. <laughs> Point out my mistake there. Now I'd like to real quick just switch over. And I guess I should do the Friends first. Uh, the Friends website, if anybody wants to go there, Parks and Recreation, Police Department, uh, you can learn more about all that. You can go down, see what's going on, programs, you know, end of the year campaign, which we is still actually ongoing. I know it's getting close to February, but donations for that are still coming in. It's to help with personal protective equipment, not just for the officers, but for the public as well, because they're always out in the public dealing uh, with people in the community. So they want to not only keep the officers safe, but the citizens safe as well. Uh, Paws and Claws, which probably brings in the most money. People love dogs and cats. Birds, all sorts of animals, great thing to give to. Uh, kind of the grapevine, they have current events, things that are going on. Uh, sponsors, a uh, lot of good sponsors, a lot of organizations that step up and donate to the Friends of Apache Junction. Uh, if you don't know who they are, definitely go to the webpage, see what businesses are given in your community and support them. See what organizations are involved. And then I, okay, we're running real late here, so let me go to, there we go, AJCDC. Uh, real quickly, um, different projects that are going on if you need somebody or know somebody who wants to sign up for the revitalization project, uh, they can do so right there from the home page. There's the focal point, and I just have to pull this up because you can order a brick right there. And oh, it did it wrong one. And if I could spell right, there we go. So I was here. You know, you can put anything you want. You can get up to four lines. It's a great way, you know, to commemorate, memorialize somebody in your family or somebody you know who's done service to their community or to the nation. So definitely think about that. Spread the word about that. And then there's Make a Difference Day. You can sign up to be one of the projects or if you know of a project, some place that needs some help. Uh, you can sign them up, say, hey, this will be a great project, or you can volunteer from that page. Just city population, local residents help, tons of waste removed. I actually don't have that extra nine tons in there yet because I just got the numbers back. So that's a lot of stuff, a lot of trash they've helped 
rid the city of, really improve and beautify the city. One final thing, uh, they're starting their Make a Difference Day t-shirt sponsorship. So if anybody has a business or knows of a business, spread the word about that. Uh, you get your name on the back of one of their volunteer t-shirts and you'll see them out here, different projects. They'll have those bright yellow shirts on. So it's a great way to get noticed. Also, if anybody's interested, and this really applies for you all in this class, if you're interested in being a board member with a nonprofit, uh, if you're interested in getting into government, that is a great first step to get on the board and become a director of an organization. I know right now the Friends of Apache Junction and the Apache Junction CDC are looking for board members. If you're interested, you can actually go straight to one of the pages and then board of directors, there's a, you can actually do it online, board of directors statement of interest. You can fill out that form, it goes straight to them and then they'll contact you back if you're interested in becoming a board member, the board director or maybe the president or vice president, treasurer, secretary, there's board positions like that uh, from time to time that are available. It's not just them, any organization that you're interested in, reach out to them and just see how you can help. All right, I'm going to end it there because we're getting very close to time. Does anybody have any questions? Well, either I did a great job or I bored you all to death. <laughs> yes. so that any donations are deductible, tax deductible, you can use the AJ Friends to be your fiduciary agent. Yeah. And they'll send you out a receipt of the funds that were donated for that. Other questions? I'm going to look one last time over here on my chat box. Nope, I think we're okay in that case. All right. You okay there, Fox? I'm good. Um, everybody's going to volunteer from here on out, right? Yes, I'm going to see everybody next Make a Difference Day. That's right. <laughs> Is there an age limit for the volunteering? No. I, well, I, some of the projects, yes. Most of them, uh, especially through Make a Difference Day, they try and have projects that are kid-friendly uh, involved with that. And the AJCDC also will try to get some of the you know, easier projects uh, that kids can help with. I know they're going to be painting bricks and doing stuff like that at the focal point because some of them are getting worn. So, you know, things like that will come up from time to time. Yes. All right. Thank you all very much for having me. Have a great evening. He's kind of, he's kind of a fellow wildcat because Kentucky are the wildcats too. Uh, okay. Uh, real quickly before we uh, uh, let you all go, remember that two weeks from now is the State of the City uh, event. All of you will get the link to, uh, to join us for State of the City. Um, that will happen about 7 o'clock on that night. Um, and that will uh, be another class uh, to be included in the ones that you want to uh, take part in. And then two weeks after that, on February 24th, uh, we will have a night of... Uh, fun and excitement with development services where they take on pretty much the whole night uh, a, a bunch of different things that are going on that night uh, Did everybody get a binder miss Smith make sure you get a binder good uh, if you have not got one There's there's some up here make sure you have all the uh, Handouts from uh, the last class. We will have a whole group of ones for the next one from tonight So you have all of that uh, hopefully everybody online had a uh, a good time. I know I was uh, chatting with them through much of the night. Um, uh, if any of you, any of you, do need to do this class online on any given night, uh, that is definitely an option. So make sure you let me know so we can send you the link uh, on that particular class. Okay, two weeks from now is State of the City, so I will see you all probably in a month on the 24th for uh, Development Services. Again, thank you all for coming, especially on this cold night. Please be careful on your way home, and as always, drive home safely. Good night.